Good morning and welcome. I'm Chris Stewart. I'll be your MC this morning. I just ask that you silence your phones. We're going to move quickly through um, this morning. We've got uh, 60 minutes and we've got sp four speakers this morning. And we'd also like to leave some um, time at the end for, for some questions. Um, you don't need to furiously take notes. The actual presentation, the PowerPoint, as well as the, um, the brief you have in front of you and the video will be posted on the BBG website in the, in the next couple days. So if you want to take notes, go ahead, but uh, it, it all will be posted. Um, we're pleased to be partnered with the Broadcasting Board of Governors as we continue our, our um, research series on topical research findings from various markets around the world. This effort is in support of BBG's mission to inform, engage, and connect people around the world in support of freedom and democracy. Today we're going to take a look at recent research from Afghanistan. Uh, we're going to take a, um, a buy in the month of, of February and we'll pick back up in March and our focus will be on, on Iraq in March. And we're still nailing down the details on, on the date, uh, so stay tuned on, on the date, unless we've, we've nailed that down this morning. 19th of March, right here in the Great Hall on Iraq. And that'll be a, a very interesting session. Obviously, it's, it's topical. Our first speaker this morning is Mr. Bruce Sherman, the Director of Office, the Office of Strategy and Development at BBG. He's going to provide some opening remarks on um, the Afghan market and, and marketing and, and how things have, have progressed over the last couple of years in, um, in Afghanistan for BBG. Bruce? Uh, very, thank you, Chris. Uh, happy to be here as always. Uh, very, very briefly, um, I dare say that if we were holding this briefing six or seven years ago, there would be people flowing out the door. Um, it's, I think, some indication of how the topic of Afghanistan, the priority of Afghanistan uh, in the public mind of Washington, and, and official Washington has uh, diminished a bit uh, with, the withdrawal, with the withdrawal of U.S. forces. Um, however, Afghanistan remains a, a critically important country in the region, uh, critically important to U.S. national security interests, very important to the BBG uh, with our broadcasting through Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and the Voice of America. Uh, we have been uh, in Afghanistan doing research for a long time. Uh, we stepped up our research after the fall of the Taliban in 2001. Uh, every year we've been in the country doing national survey work, uh, doing in-depth qualitative research work. So we have a long view of how things have progressed in the country. And you'll hear here today our most recent findings from the research that we've just completed. Um, it is a, a country where, uh, although in these briefings, we focus not on our performance as broadcasters, we focus on the media environment. It is, however, a country where uh, we together, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, and the Voice of America do exceptionally well in terms of reaching significant audiences. Uh, so, and part of that success, we believe, uh, is a result of our attempt to understand audiences, understand the media environment, how people are shifting in terms of their use of media over the years. Uh, so it remains a very important country to us uh, in terms, as Chris noted, how we approach the market, how we market to audiences, how we operate in the country, which distribution systems, which media platforms we choose to use. And you'll see in here today uh, that, uh, in fact, in Afghanistan, although uh, still, relatively speaking, uh, an underdeveloped media environment, I say relative to, say, Iran, relative to other countries across the region, the Middle East, and nonetheless, is a place where we're on multiple platforms and are taking advantage of multiple ways of reaching audiences. Uh, so again, I welcome you. Uh, we support these briefings to make research available about media environments to the broader public. Uh, we do this, as uh, Chris has noted, on a regular basis. We look forward to the next briefing. Thanks for coming today, and I'll turn it over now to our briefers. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Bruce. Our first presenter this morning is uh, Mr. Muhammad Yunus, a senior analyst and senior practice consultant at Gallup. Muhammad's going to talk to you this morning about our Gallup World Poll and uh, trend lines and, and findings from Afghanistan. We, we recently conducted our latest uh, round of interviewing in Afghanistan. And uh, this is part of a 165 country effort where we're doing ongoing data collection on um, attitudes and opinions in, in like I said, 165 countries around the world. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Muhammad Yunus. Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, welcome back to many of 
you who are uh, some Gallup alums in the uh, audience as well as uh, repeat visitors. Um, as, as Chris mentioned, I will be sharing some of our findings from the World Poll. Uh, we do this uh, as part of the series in order to just give some national context um, for the media information that we'll be uh, going over later together uh, in Afghanistan. Um, Chris mentioned uh, a few things about the World Poll. The World Poll is an initiative that was started by Gallup. It's a 100-year commitment uh, for us to continue to measure the pulse of the world um, on a series uh, of metrics and, and on a series of topics. Uh, as Chris mentioned, we are now live in 160 plus countries annually. Um, I also want to recognize two of my colleagues in the room uh, who've played a, a crucial role in a lot of the data we're going to see uh, in my portion of the presentation. Dr. Rajesh uh, Srinivasan is our regional director for Asia. Um, and Dr. Steve Crabtree is one of our lead analysts for the World Poll and has spent a lot of his time looking at the data both out of Afghanistan and Iraq. A little bit about the methodology in Afghanistan, it's very similar um, in most developing countries. Uh, all c surveys are conducted face to face. We've done nine since 2008 in Afghanistan. Our last survey, which is actually a very important thing to keep in mind throughout the entirety of my presentation. Um, was actually conducted in a very uh, political, sort of tumultuous moment in Afghanistan. We were in, in field uh, between mid-August and about uh, uh, mid-September. Just a week after we stopped polling uh, for this wave of data, uh, an agreement was reached between Ashraf Ghani and, uh, and, and Abdullah to share power to some degree. As you all know, as people were following the elections, um, there was a lot of allegations of fraud, and it wasn't really clear whether or not there would be uh, a sort of an agreed to outcome of the election. There was a lot of talk about civil disobedience, and some people were even talking about potential civil war in some parts of the country. So it's really important to keep that political context in mind when we look at some of the assessments in uh, people and how they saw their future, uh, how they definitely they assess the security situation, which is something we'll talk about later. Uh, most of our surveys are conducted um, in face-to-face -face in developing countries. In Afghanistan, we do it in two languages, in both Pashto and Dari. Um, we do it with about 1,000 respondents per country. For this data set, the margin of error is about 3.8 uh, percentage points. So I wanted to talk a little bit about well-being, um, basic needs, and then we'll get into some of the security items. But really, the biggest story from our data in 2014 from Afghanistan is really the, the horrible life evaluation metrics uh, that, that we saw in the data set. It is currently um, the worst life evaluation metrics of not only last year, 2014, but actually in our thriving, uh, suffering, struggling metrics, which I'll show you in a minute, that are based on these numerical values, it was actually the worst that we've ever recorded uh, since we started the World Poll. But let's take a look uh, at how we measure life evaluation uh, in the World Poll. We ask respondents on a scale of zero to 10, where zero is the worst possible life for them, 10 is the best possible life, to evaluate their lives today, and then what they think their lives will be in the next five years. So as you can see, on average, Afghans in uh, the summer of 2014 were at about 3.7 on a scale of zero to 10 uh, in saying what their life will be in five years. And in assessing their life currently, they were at about a 3.13 on a scale from zero to 10. Um, so it's it, obviously there's a downward trend. Um, and, and I just wanted to share, we don't usually actually share the numeric value, but I really wanted to show you kind of how low uh, on the metric we are on this. If you would only imagine in your own life where you would have to be to say that you were on a three from zero to 10, you really start to get a feel for how, how negative people are, are viewing their lives. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, there are very unique things about the life evaluation metrics with Afghanistan. We usually see a youth bonus in many countries where young people have a more positive perspe perspective, especially on the future. That doesn't exist in our data set in Afghanistan, which is very troubling. Um, there are also rural and urban splits that we'll discuss later. We use those numeric values to place respondents into one of three categories, either thriving at the top, best evaluations, struggling somewhere in the middle, and suffering at the bottom. So respondents don't describe themselves as any of these three categories. They give us a numeric value, and we calculate um, them into these categories. If you're at a seven or higher today and an eight or higher in the next five years, you're placed into the thriving category. If you're at a four or below today or in the next five years, you're placed into that suffering category. So we can see in Afghanistan, uh, the rate of suffering has just exponentially increased since 2012. Um, and a lot of that, historically what we know, the drivers for low li life evaluations tends to be poverty and hopelessness about economic conditions. Um, so in addition to that, when you also consider the security situation, when you consider the drug trade issue and drug addiction problem in the country, there really are a series of variables that really 
undermine sort of um, having a hopeful outlook on the future of one's life or the country's future generally. This is a, a regional breakdown of the rate of suffering. As you can see uh, in the West, we have the highest rate at 74% of respondents falling into that suffering category. Again, that means they rate their lives at a four or worse today and in five years, and all the way up to the East where uh, half of respondents, obviously also not a great metric, but certainly better um, than other parts of the country. We'll see this trend uh, on one of the security items uh, or attitudes about the Taliban in a, in a later slide in the presentation. This is a question that we ask about uh, basic needs. And what you're looking at here are the respondents who said that in the past 12 months, there was a time where they didn't have enough money to provide food for their family or provide adequate shelter for their family. So in 2014, 43% of respondents said that they didn't have, uh, there was a time in the past 12 months where they didn't have enough money for shelter and 41% on food. Um, these numbers actually get much worse when you look at the rural compared to the urban metrics. And then corruption. Um, we did see a little bit of an improvement back in 2009 to 2010, but back up again, 73% say that corruption is widespread in business, 85% say in government. Um, and this really is obviously not unique to Afghanistan. In the neighborhood, uh, uh, these numbers are, are pretty consistent across many of the countries in that part of the world. But you know, considering the access to basic needs when 40% of people basically don't have what they need to get through the day. And there's a widespread perception of corruption, both in government and the private sector. It really does create an environment that is ripe for losing faith in the credibility of national institutions and really sort of losing faith in the national narrative. And I think that's one of the major dangers that's not necessarily security related that really will continue with Afghanistan post, as, as Chris very notably mentioned, you know, the global media shifts focus after the US and NATO withdrawal. Let's look a little bit uh, at our items on security in NATO. We ask this item almost everywhere in the world where we can. It's, do you feel safe walking alone at night in the city or area where you live? Um, in, the, in the summer of 2014, 62% of respondents said they did not. It's important to keep in mind that the, the violence uh, really, there was a noticeable uptick in violence generally in 2014. Um, just to kind of give you a, an estimate, I was just jotting these numbers down. In the 13 years of the entire war, which is the longest war in US history, 3,500 soldiers, both NATO and US, mostly US, um, have, ha, have lost their lives in the fight. In 2014 alone, 3,200 Afghan civilians lost their lives, and 4,600 Afghan security forces lost their lives. So there were more Afghan security forces who died in 2014 than there were NATO and US forces in the entirety of the 13 years war. So when we look at these upcoming security items, keep in mind that the, you know, the respondents were kind of going through Number one, one of the bloodiest years of the war. And number two, a moment of, of very high political um, uncertainty with the election. Confidence in the military remains high, although it dipped a bit from 2013 to 2014. 71% still have confidence um, in the military. But most don't think that the government is doing enough to fight terrorism. 57% um, in 2014 said that. It, it's certainly an improvement from the previous 65% in 2013, but certainly uh, not the kind of metric uh, one would hope for as the global community shifts its focus away from Afghanistan, at least militarily. Um, these are two items. There's a lot of information on these slides. These are basically two items. On the left, we're talking about whether or not things will get better or worse post-withdrawal. On the right, we're asking whether or not the presence of the Taliban will increase or decrease or stay the same post withdrawal. And on the left, you can see a little bit of an improvement in people that say things will get worse. 39% uh, in 2014 compared to 43 in 2013, but still a clear minority uh, think that things will get better post US and NATO forces leaving the country. On the right side, we asked, do you think the Taliban presence will increase after the withdrawal? Uh, and again, uh, an improvement, a noticeable improvement, 46% say that their presence will increase, uh, which is a, a noticeably you know, down from 60% in 2013. I think it's also interesting to keep in mind that with the security situation unraveling a bit in 2014, it is very promising that people actually said that their presence, uh, the people that said that the presence will increase has dropped. Now certainly, you know, two points is not a trend, uh, but it, is, it did actually catch my attention that it did improve so much in an environment where clearly a lot of Afghan security forces were losing their lives. The population was watching that happen and hopefully what's happening is that people are realizing that the government that is gonna be left over and the army that stands now in Afghanistan is very much committed to fighting the Taliban and that it's not gonna be 
um, sort of business as usual uh, pre-war. That's a very optimistic view. That's my view. I'm not claiming that's what the data says. Uh, but hopefully, that's, that's one of the wins, if you will, from this engagement. Um, and again, the rural comparisons on uh, perceptions that the presence of the Taliban will increase post-withdrawal, I don't think anybody who's familiar with the country, I don't think that those are surprising regional comparisons. Um, in this country, do you have confidence in the national government or not? This is, again, a question we ask in almost every country. 47% uh, of respondents said that they do not have confidence in the national government, Why 41% said they did. Obviously, um, it, it was sort of an interesting moment to ask this question because the national government, or at least the political leadership, was on its way out, um, and it wasn't clear who was going to take over. I wanted to end on this, this note because I think it's one of the optimistic points um, in what is a very challenging sort of data set to look through. Um, still, a majority of Afghans say that media in their country have a lot of freedom, and access to information is really a crucial part of BBG's mission. And it's really one of the things that has changed, whether you were for the war or against the war or somewhere in between. One of the things that has changed in that country is people's access to information. And when you think about the challenges the country faces, education, poverty, even drug addiction, and certainly radicalization, access to information can be really a power-shifting variable in how the country tackles a lot of the challenges that they face moving forward. So with that, I'll hand it back to Chris and look forward to uh, looking at this media information. Thank you, Mohammed. Our next speaker this morning is Ms. Sonia Glocal, the Director of Research uh, at the International Broadcasting Bureau. Sonia is going to be talking to us this morning about a, a recent BBG survey on media usage. She's going to focus on uh, news use in Afghanistan. Sonia? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And it is true, while we just had a rather dire picture in terms of public opinion questions that Mohammed has presented, the media sector is indeed a little bit more uplifting. I will be covering over the next few minutes the general media use for news and looking at the relative importance of different platforms. And then I will very briefly go into radio, mobile, and internet before Paul will be covering the TV sector in much greater depth because this is really where a lot of the opportunities are these days. Um, a quick overview on how the BBG Gallup study was, a media study was conducted in Afghanistan. We had face-to-face -face interviews with 2,000 um, randomly selected adults aged 15 and, or older, and these were representative of virtually all adults in the country. Field work happened just before Ramadan, as opposed to the Gallup World Poll, which happened just post-Ramadan. And data are obviously weighted for age, gender, region, and educational attainment. When you look, um, the next few slides will be covering specifically sources that people use to get news and information. And I'm looking directly here every time the percentage will be people who said they use this particular platform daily or most days for news, just because I wanted to look specifically at people who are very interact with a certain platform on a very frequent basis because this is really um, how you can reach them later on. And you can see that Afghanistan is now a TV market, um, slightly t with TV being slightly ahead of radio. Almost half of the population uses TV on a daily or most days a week basis to get news and information. Um, so that's the good news. But when you then look at new media, internet, SMS, and social media, we are really still very, very low. It's a really nascent market still, and you'll see this over as we break down the um, use of these platforms by several different demographic indicators. Let's first look at gender. We do see, not surprisingly, it's something we do see in many markets, um, men being ahead of women in terms of the use of all different platforms. That is, but that's also clearly a reflection of men being more avid news consumers in most markets to begin with. So it's not surprising that their use of TV in this case is 10 percentage points higher, radio the gap is even larger, and then um, particularly for internet, SMS, and social media, we also see very large gaps which are obviously also linked to educational attainment in this case. Which, um, the, educational gap, as you know, in Afghanistan between men and women is very high. When you look at urban-rural breakdown, um, TV is clearly 
the right medium to reach urbanites. Four in five Afghan adults use TV on a daily or most days a week basis to get news. If you then look um, at the rural areas, radio re here really is still a key platform when about half of rural Afghans use radio on a daily or most days a week basis to get news and information. Uh, not surprisingly, new media are of course much more frequently used in urban areas. Breaking down the news for news by ethnic group, um, which is of course also highly related to um, the geographic dispersion of ethnic groups and the various education, the urban rural um, um, dispersion and also the educational attainment um, between different groups. But you can see that Uzbek, um, Tajik, sorry, Tajiks are the most avid TV consumers versus um, Pashtuns and Hazara being the most avid radio consumers. Interestingly, at the very right, when you then look at um, friends or family, or what we use as an indicator for the use of word of mouth, you can see it's almost like a staircase between the different um, ethnic groups, um, Pashtuns being the ones who are most um, likely to use friends and family as a source of news and information, and Hazara being the ones who are least likely to do so. Um, this slide I find particularly interesting because it's really not interesting at all. <laughs> In most countries, we do see very large gaps between those who are under 35 in their use of media and those who are over 35. Afghanistan being almost a, con a complete exception to this case. We do see a little bit more um, TV consumption for news amongst those under 35. But look at radio, for example, every, every age group uses it to um, the same degree. And even in new media, where we again would expect a real youth bubble, we don't see that difference very much. And here, when, we come, when it comes to education, you really do see very vast differences between the different educational attainments and their use of different platforms for news and information. And this is really the only place where there's any a way to interact with a group um, through internet, which is at least one in five people who, um, who have post-secondary education use the internet on a daily basis. So this is the only group that can actually be reached if you want to use new media. And when we look at media use by satisfaction, um, so looking at those people who say they're either very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, or somewhat um, or very dissatisfied with media, you can see some real differences. And it's not surprising, really, that the correlation goes, those who are very satisfied with media are also mo most likely co to consume different news platforms. Those who are um, somewhat or very dissatisfied with media are also the least likely to consume different platforms. Here on this slide, we look at the people who are somewhat or very dissatisfied with the media, with the information provided by the media, and you can see that it is apparently linked to access to media sources because women are more likely to be dissatisfied as are rural people, as are those without formal education, which are really, that's the, the most vulnerable group that can be left out of mainstream news consumption. And um, just one quick look at radio use. Um, FM use is pretty much the same across um, urban and rural um, areas, and it is still really the most prevalent wave band in Afghanistan. What is interesting here, oftentimes we see in many markets, we see FM use being um, significantly higher in urban areas. That's not surprising because you do have more FM stations to choose from. However, in Afghanistan, you actually see that rural is t tick higher. Um, that's easily explained because radio use in rural areas is higher to begin with for um, AM, you can see very clearly, much more popular in rural areas, and um, shortwave is actually interesting because with its 12% nationwide or 15% in rural areas, Afghanistan is one of the last markets really where shortwave does play a role in reaching um, particularly rural populations. Mobile phone use um, to listen to the radio is higher in um, Urban areas, um, A, as I've just said, this has to do with the fact that people use um, their mobile phone to tune into FM, FM more prevalent in urban areas, and also the ownership rate of mobile phones in urban areas is significantly higher than in rural areas. 
And speaking of mobile phone, um, three out of five Afghan adults personally own a mobile phone. And that's the strong number. So as we go down here, the numbers really whittle down. Um, just 14% of those Afghans who own a mobile phone say they have a smartphone. Um, just 35% of those in Afghanistan who own a mobile phone have sent an SMS in the past week. That's a very, very low rate compared to other markets we look at. And then particularly low is that just 8% of Afghan mobile phone owners say they have access to internet on a mobile phone in the past week. Now these numbers might seem extremely small, but then we should not forget that just three years ago, uh, it's been less than three years since the first um, 3G licenses in the country have been doled out. And internet use is also still really in its infancy. 9% of Afghan adults have accessed the internet in the past week. Most of that internet access, in fact 75%, um, has happened at home. So unlike other markets, um, public spaces, work, um, school, internet cafes are less important. Um, what I find also very interesting, in a lot of markets we do see how um, desktop, laptop, um, internet access is already completely bypassed and everything goes straight to mobile. That's not the case in Afghanistan. We do see over half of internet users mostly use a desktop or a laptop to access the internet and 40% of internet users use a mobile or a tablet device to access the internet. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Paul because as I said, the most interesting changes are in the TV market. Thank you, Sonia. Sonia. We've got a special guest this morning in from, from Prague. Um, we're joined this morning by Mr. Paul Tibbetts, the Director of Market Insight and Evaluation for Radio Free Europe and, and Radio Liberty. And Paul's going to talk to us this morning about the, the rise in, in television in, um, in Afghanistan. So, Paul. Thank you, Chris. Good morning. Nice to be with you in the room and not just a big Oz face on the screen from Prague. Um, as Sonia highlighted, when the BBG received the data this year from Afghanistan, the finding that was the most striking to us was the rise of TV. You know, since we went back into Afghanistan with survey research following 9-11, we've really thought about Afghanistan as being a radio market. And so we saw some usage of television in urban areas. It was very different, very separate from what was happening in the rest of the country. And if you wanted to reach mass audiences, you did that with radio. Um, in this year's survey, and not just ours, but also in, in work I've seen from others, uh, has highlighted the importance of TV. So I'll spend a little bit of time diving into some of the TV findings a bit. Um, just reminding folks, um, these are BBG surveys from the last couple of years looking at the rise of TV. If we're going from daily use of TV being about a quarter of the population in 2008, there's a slow rise by 2011, but then a very sharp rise of now half the population using TV, um, watching TV on a daily basis in 2014. If we look at how this breaks down a bit, uh, TV usage is highest in the north of the country. This is not surprising. This is where the electricity supply is the most reliable. Radio, you can get by with radio on batteries, but TV, you really, you probably need to be plugged into the mains or at least have a generator. Down in the south and the southwest, we see lower levels of TV viewing. Some of this is because these are areas that are more likely to be under Taliban control or Taliban influence where ownership and viewing of a television set is problematic. Um, you know, remembering looking at the rise of TV after 9-11, uh, after you know, there was no TV in Afghanistan under the Taliban. And now we have quite a bit of variety within the market. Sonia has looked at some of this in the general media presentation, but I wanted to pull all of the TV stuff together on a single slide for you in terms of looking at, you know, who is the, the average Afghan TV viewer? Where do we see differences within the population? Um, there is a skew in terms of non-Pashtuns being more likely to watch TV. Again, given the geographical spread in the north of the country is where the ethnic Tajiks are. That's not too terribly surprising. We do still see a preference for TV in urban areas or, um, compared to rural areas. As Sonia said, men more likely to watch TV than women. Uh, and media usage, not just TV, but media usage in general rising with education. 
Um, the dog that didn't bark is around age. A youth are slightly more likely to watch TV, but there isn't a big difference um, across the population in terms of age and TV viewing. If we look at urban and rural ownership, we see, okay, um, ownership of TVs in urban areas, and the estimate is about 20, 21% urban. Um, so the urban population is smaller than the rural population in Afghanistan. Almost everybody's got a TV. And in urban areas, they primarily say that they're getting their TV signal via an antenna. Rural areas, you know, just over half say that they own a TV. Um, some antenna and some satellite. Why the satellite bit is important is urban satellite owners um, and rural, because of the satellite ownership, they're each equally likely to be consuming content from international providers, um, to be watching TV stations from other countries. So this was interesting. Given the gap in terms of TV viewership and TV ownership between urban and rural, we do see um, equal likelihood for consumption of international channels across urban and rural. There wasn't a big difference there. As with other parts of the media, the competition in TV has exploded over the last several years. Um, there's a lot of different stations for folks to choose from. This slide looks at language ability. Um, not surprisingly, most television channels are more popular with Dari speakers than Pashto speakers. Dari speakers are just more likely to watch TV. Um, the two exceptions on this list are Lamar TV and Shamshad TV. These are both Pashto language channels, not surprisingly, more popular with those who speak Pashto. Um, this slide's a little more interesting in terms of the gender difference. Men more likely to watch TV than women, so men more likely to watch the individual channels. There's a couple of exceptions on the slide. Tolo TV, which was the first private news channel in Afghanistan, currently people's most important information source, the top media outlet in the country, doing better among women, as is the sister channel in Pashto, Lamar TV. And so I talked a little bit with my colleagues about what might be some of the reasons behind that. Tolo was first. Uh, there is definitely a first mover advantage there. This is a fairly conservative society, but Tolo in particular does a live daily women show during the day um, where they have call-ins, they have a doctor who comes in, and so this may explain that they're targeting female audiences during the course of the day when the woman's at home. She has more control over what they're watching, um, you know, so she may be tuning in to watch that on her own. Um, and Tolo is also known for its entertainment programming, um, including Afghan Star. So if we look at regular TV viewers and who they are, we see an interesting multiplier effect because they tend to be more satisfied with media, they tend to be following current events more often, they tend to be consuming media more often, they're more active media consumers, but what's interesting for us is they're actually, they're also more likely to be sharing and discussing current events information and what they've found in media. So even though TV viewership may only be 50% of the population, we see that there's a multiplier effect that they're more likely to be talking about media, sharing information from media, passing along um, what they saw on TV. So that's a little bit of a, a deep dive there on TV. Um, and I get the honor of talking about sort of the key takeaways that the three presenters put together in terms of uh, today's presentation. So from the Gallup World Poll, what was most striking was the high rate of suffering, being the highest rate of suffering in the world. Um, looking at media consumption, um, being highly related to education, also not surprising given literacy rates. The World Bank estimate is about a third of Afghans are literate. So those with a post-secondary education are more most avid media users overall, and with highly educated Afghans most likely to be using various platforms, and as Sonia highlighted, most likely to be online. So if you're, if you're doing an online effort, you know, you're going at a, a more educated population, which is also something that I see with some of the other work that we do for RFERL in Central Asia, that internet users tend to be highly educated. Radio remains important, certainly, particularly among rural audiences, but we see TV gaining in uh, popularity, not just an urban phenomenon anymore, but across the country itself, uh, and with its dominance in the north due to the stable electricity supply.
Thank you, Paul. We've got time for some questions. I've got some colleagues in the back of the room who have microphones. If you just um, raise your hand, state your name and your organization. Right here. Hi, Michal Haskell from the Center for Army Analysis and just returned from about eight months in Afghanistan. Um, we work uh, at, at ISAF with a lot of government-sponsored uh, surveys. Um, and I can't remember off the top of my head the numbers, but I was wondering if you guys compare the results from some of your surveys to the government-sponsored surveys and if there are differences that you've seen. From my memory, part of our issues with the government surveys is that there's really very little variance between um, anything from 2007, seven, eight until today. I mean, really, it's almost flatlined. Um, and so I was wondering if you guys looked into that at all. You say, I, I can, uh, I'm personally not aware whether or not we've done that um, as a concerted effort. Chris, do you want to speak? I'll, I'll take that. So there's, been, there's a number of programs that have been initiated in Afghanistan. I mean, there's the Afghan National Quarterly Assessment Research. Um, there's various regional command surveys that have taken place, a variety of programs. There's an annual Asia Society survey, Asia Foundation survey that comes out in the November time frame. We do take a look at those surveys. Um, and I think one of the things that I've looked at very closely over the years is the methodology and per particularly the coverage. Um, and I think one of the things that um, has been a challenge, you know, we've, we've been able to manage through it and we're, we're very focused on the integrity of, of the sampling process and not replacing a lot of sample. Um, we've got interviewers that are spread out in the local, you know, all 34 provinces. So we're not sending in people from Kabul to another location. They, they know the, the communities, they know the ground environment and have a higher probability of, of getting an interview completed and they're less likely to state that this area is not permissible. And I think one of the challenges with some of those other programs has been, if you look through the methodology, a lot of the, the country has been um, replay, uh, basically they've stated that we couldn't get into to regions because of security concerns. So comparability becomes a challenge from one survey to another. Um, you know, I think that um, the latest round of, of the uh, November survey of the Asia Foundation, um, they're seeing some of these same trends. You know, they're going in, in the, the wrong direction. And so it'll be interesting as, as um, our activities, you know, we'll still be on the ground, but as our activities diminish in the, in the country, um, where these trends might go what the role of some of those regional players and how's that going to, to impact some of these scores. Rajesh, I don't know whether you've got any comments. No, I think you're absolutely right. Of the reputable surveys out there that we compare, the clearly better quality. And I think that's the main difference. Next question, right here. Hi, Joe Brinker, USAID. Uh, it's good to see that the, we finally can put something concrete behind the shift to television, because I think we've seen that coming, but haven't really uh, had anything to nail it down with, uh, so that's good. But the, the internet use and the social media is still uh, pretty surprising when it comes to youth. Um, is there any uh, more background on that? Uh, because I think there's been a common assumption that, uh, that youth were using social media more uh, there was a lot of talk about that during the election. There was an assumption somehow that uh, that they were being reached through social media, and uh, if the numbers are that low, uh, probably not. So, is there is there a little bit more uh, why behind that? Well, there's a certain group, um, and I did. I should preface to say that I merged the 15 through 24 group with the 24 through 34 group, um, a 25 through 34 group. So if we just had looked at the 15 through 24 year olds, we do see their use um, being a little bit higher yet than the, um, the 25 year olds plus. But if you look at a certain, as I think I had pointed out, if you're going after male post-secondary educated urbanites, 
that's when you can really get, that's when you can use it. So there is a group, and I do think the reason why we have a common perception that yes, it is possible to reach these groups, it's a vocal group. <laughs> it's, it's very visible, yeah. And I think too, and I'll let Steve jump in, I think too part of it is, you know, we were looking at the magnitudes of difference, and there has been growth in the internet population. And in terms of the survey, this year we did see a rise in the internet using population, but it remained such a small segment overall. And for the first time we had measurable alliances for some of the BBG efforts online that we hadn't seen before. But it's this, you know, it had hovered around sort of one percent of the population for a while. And so if you get up to four, you know, yeah, that is an increase, but these other platforms still remain much more important. Dr. I, I think there's a huge limiting factor in the literacy rate in Afghanistan. Um, Paul mentioned it's 32 percent, something like that. And I think that's the lowest in the world. Other people who are Afghanistan experts in the um, audience can, can maybe help with that. But um, you, ha you have to be able to read and write to use the internet, essentially, right? You don't have to, to, be, to watch TV. The younger, more likely to read. Or older. I, I don't know how you know. I don't know how reliable those statistics are. First of all, and second, you know, we, we I guess we are seeing some increase among younger people, but um, I still think when when you, you cap everybody out at one third, that's mm -hmm. you know, it's still something that you really have to consider. Well, Steve, uh, also keep in mind that the media survey is also only 15 year old and older, so that sort of it, right. explosion in the literacy rate change is probably happening below 15, yeah, because the war's you know it's only been 13 years. And certainly what I see coming out of the other Central Asian data um, from the neighboring countries is young, highly educated, urban. You know, I think we'll see it, but it's still probably a couple of years off. Um, and then seeing if it gets outside of Kabul and Mazar. But, you know, it'll be a very concentrated urban phenomenon. But just weighing in and speaking more broadly to the assumptions we make here, uh, and, I, and I refer to Washington broad public diplomacy assumptions about how people are consuming media around the world. And our emphasis on digital first is at great variance with reality in the world. And you can see in Afghanistan the rise in the use of television. Uh, and we see this uh, in so many areas. We were just here not too long ago looking at the most recent Pakistan data from June of this year. And there again, another critically important country for the United States where if you're taking a look, relatively speaking, of different media platforms to reach audiences, you absolutely want to be on television. You have to be on television, really. And, and you're seeing this as Paul's segment of the presentation pointed out with respect to television in Afghanistan. Generally speaking, across the world, use of television has not decreased with the rise of social media or digital media. Uh, and use of television by youth across the world has not also decreased with the rise of social media and digital media. And the other critical factor is that when you're in those environments, that is to say, digital information, the internet, they're wildly fragmented. Uh, you're the proverbial grain of sand on the beach in many, in many instances with respect to the range of choice that people have. Whereas, if you're on television, it can secure a decent time slot, close to prime time, on a, on a, on a respected network. Your opportunity of reaching significant audiences expands dramatically over uh, social media even, or digital media of any kind. And that's not something I think that we hear when we, and at least in the conversations that, that I'm in regularly uh, in Washington across the government, that we typically focus on. We tend to skew towards what we perceive here in this country and we project that onto the rest of the world and that's just not reality, which is why the research here, again, is so critically important, because it, it gives us an opportunity to look past what our, our assumptions might be about where things are going in the world with respect to media. Not to diminish, again, here, the importance of digital social media, not to diminish that at all, uh, just to put it in perspective. Right here. Hi, my name is Cameron. I'm with Internews. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about the rollout of digital television and how that might impact the television market and sort of the timeline of that. Yeah, 
I mean, I'm definitely not the one to talk about it. Right. No, I don't know. I'm looking, I'm looking past <laughs> Bruce, Sonia. And, I feel like uh, Bruce, you kind Paul. of addressed it a little bit. Well, here's the thing about it. I'll just, I'll just mention to you that um, anecdotally, um, tomorrow I leave for Dubai to meet with leading Pakistani and, and uh, Afghan uh, media uh, representatives, representatives of media organizations, including some of those mentioned here in the survey. Uh, the thrust of our effort is to uh, secure the appropriate partnerships with media outlets uh, uh, to take advantage of whatever direction the uh, distribution of, of television might assume, but certainly the current distribution, terrestrial distribution, uh, over leading outlets. Um, so uh, that's where our focus is uh, right now. I would say this, and in, in, in looking at the, uh, the market in Afghanistan, uh, when television develops the way it has, uh, unless we own television stations in the country, our content is going to be uh, distributed through partners. So there are intermediaries that we use to reach our audiences. And the obvious issue that that raises is we can't do this alone. We can't put anything we want on somebody else's television network. We have to put something on that they want to broadcast, that they think is important for their audiences, that works with their format, that fits broadly speaking their, 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 their positioning and their branding in the market and so forth. And that's a significant shift over a direct broadcasting model, uh, which has declined precipitously with the decline in the use of shortwave across the country. Um, now, we still have 15 local radio stations across Afghanistan that we operate, so we are directly broadcasting 24 hours a day ready for Europe and VOA content to audiences in the country. But with the rise of TV, it becomes a, a different proposition, and therefore, the TV play for us is through partners. Whichever direction the technology behind TV goes, it's gonna be a partnership play. Right here in front. I am Kimi Azade. Um, I was wondering what types of programs are available in general for Afghans and from what countries and what they're about or what their mission is. Uh, Voice of America and, and Radio Free Europe programs or programs in general? TV and radio. So in terms of, of what's on the program stream that Bruce highlighted, so um, RFURL through Radio Azadi and VOA through Ashna have a variety of news and current affairs programming, call-in shows, health programs, women's shows, youth shows uh, throughout the course of the day. I know Azadi also does a music program. Um, VOA has some learning English later on in the evening very active in terms of their Persian service um, and also through um, Persian TV. Persian TV has an audience in Afghanistan. Um, there's um, quite a few different actors who try to reach the, the country, the Iranian, the and Pashto programming as well, trying to reach Afghan audiences. Um, yeah, um, there's Pakistan efforts. So it's a, it's a very media rich environment from you know, what we thought of as the classic radio audience and this classic shortwave audience, that there was a lot that was available to Afghan audiences and where we see direction moving, our investment in FM transmitters. BBC has even more locally throughout Afghanistan where they have um, Dari and Pashto programming along with Uzbek programming again throughout the day. Looking at um, FM as really being the future. So there's, there's a range of, of programming out Next question. Right here. Sort of related to my, uh, my first one. Um, getting back a little bit to the use of uh, social media, I, I think Pakistan was brought into the discussion. And I think that's what's interesting to me uh, is that if you look at uh, social media use among Pakistanis, young Pakistanis, it's, it's significant. And, and particularly because in, in many cases they're cut off, there's rules about who they can associate with, and so they, they, they rely on social media in many cases. And so I'm just, to me it seems like Afghanistan with a lot of the, sim, 
a lot of similar social mores could, uh, is, is coming. Uh, and so, you know, it, I just wonder, you know, what, what the, what the uh, right combination is going to be for that, that shift to happen, because I spend a lot of time in Pakistan as well, mm -hmm. and there it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very prevalent, and, uh, and yeah, the TV market there is, is very well developed, so it's kind of interesting to see Afghanistan now coming along uh, online that way. Uh, but I just, I just, I see social media. You know, it, it, it's, it's latent. It's out there. Um, it, the right combination might not be there yet, which is why it's still very low. But uh, there's other factors there that make it, I think, you know, very, a very interest, interesting latency. Paul, yeah. I, I think um, it's a really interesting co comparison to compare Afghanistan and Pakistan because I agree with your prognosis. I think um, Afghanistan is just a few years behind the phenomenon we're seeing in Pakistan. And I do think, I, I mentioned it earlier, but we can really not forget that it's just been less than three years since these um, 3G licenses were rolled out in Afghanistan. And we do see in a lot of other countries, a lot of the social media use actually does happen on mobile platforms. It's app related. So as that becomes more and more popular, I do think we will probably look at a very similar picture. Paul, did you have anything? Yeah, just quickly. I think Pakistan's a little bit different, though, in terms of the role of English yeah. in Pakistani society, of English being the gateway into social networks and kind of that global community. That's something that's missing in Afghanistan. And I do have to assume generally internet usage and availability is much higher in Pakistan. Um, we only broadcast to the Fatah in Pakistan. And there, you know, again, it's very, uh, very conservative, very, that's still very radio driven. Um, we have some problems getting in there in terms of survey work. So I, that situation probably has changed. Um, but you know, that little slice is so different from the rest of the Urdu language dominant areas of Pakistan. I mean, literacy rates are also very different, and it's just, a, it's a much, I mean, you've been there, it's a much richer country, so it's, a lot of it is also economics. Um, I also know a lot of Pakistanis that would take major issue with your mores comparison, but it really, it really does depend on what part of Pakistan you're talking about, and so it's, it's, a, it's a much more mixed bag. But the, I think the English, the literacy rates, and just the economics, the infrastructure, I mean, there are a lot of other factors that tie into why people are maybe not using social media. It actually, as it happens, I have Pakistan data on my laptop. The, because we were, we're, we're all over this stuff, right? We just had a briefing here a few months ago. So just to, just to cite the statistics from uh, the slide presentation that our, that our briefers gave here on Pakistan and, and comparing apples to apples, and that is media use for news. Not use overall, but media use for news. Uh, in Pakistan, uh, nationwide, it's 4%. Uh, daily use for news uh, across the entire country, and interestingly enough, in Afghanistan on this slide, it's 4% in terms of internet. It's the same thing. Um, in terms of uh, use of SMS, it's 6% in Pakistan, 4% in Afghanistan. Social media, uh, 3% nationwide overall in, in Pakistan, and 2% in Afghanistan. The difference is, as Sonia pointed out, Mo was just talking about it, again, if you're looking at better educated urbanite males, Right? It's, a, it's a different proposition. And so it's a targeting issue, which obviously the differential use of media allows us as programmers to go to specific targets, specific platforms, and try to be effective there. Um, but then you have the dynamics of each particular platform that you have to deal with. In terms of the range of choice, how people use the platform, uh, they use the medium, and the analysis then becomes very specific to that effort to try to reach them. The, and getting back again then to a broad media strategy for these countries, and you can just accomplish a tremendous amount with one great hit TV show, reaching across wide ranges of, of uh, 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 demographic uh, uh, groups in the, in the country. Um, Again, not to say the social media and digital are not important, they are, it's just a different situation. Can, can I just do something completely unorthodox? I will just, so I, I spent a lot of my time focusing on the Middle East. We had this issue with Egypt and the whole like social media Arab Spring, and everybody was looking for the social media holy grail. If you think about just one, just exactly what Bruce said, if you think about the role social media played in the protests, and a show like Bassem Youssef's show, the Egyptian Jon Stewart, I mean, the show had massive impact to the point where, you know, 
people loved it and then people hated it, but everybody was watching and everybody was talking about it. And the social media thing, really, a couple months after those initial protests with Mubarak, everybody kind of lost faith in, in social media being this holy grail, kind of what's gonna connect people. So I'm all for what Bruce is saying. I still feel like TV and many of these, and Egypt obviously is completely different than both Pakistan and Afghanistan. But it's, it's also the similar kind of political dynamic of the role of information, societies that are changing very quickly, and people a lot of times that are using that access to information to do very bad things in some situations. Like a lot of social media associated with protests in the Middle East have actually not been very positive. They've been very sectarian. They've been encouraging people to commit violence. So there's a whole other kind of dark side to the social media thing that's not you know, necessarily something we want to you know, get behind. Do we have a final question? In the back. <laughs> Gray Brown from D3 Systems. Um, we do a lot of media perception work um, in Afghanistan. So my question is, what kind of media perception research, qualitative research, do you do for your programming? Sure, I can. Um, and we worked with you on some of that. Um, not for a while, but. Um, it really, I mean, our qualitative research tends to be um, fairly tactical in terms of what we're trying to do with a particular program. Are we trying to reach a specific group? Are we launching a new show? Um, we're doing a lot of work, or looking to do some work soon in the future on issues of, you know, RFERL and VOA are on this 24-7 stream. What exactly does that mean? Um, how clear are the brand perceptions of each of the broadcasters? How you know, we see them as being very different from one another. What does the audience see? Afghanistan's a difficult research environment in terms of trying to um, ask people to be critical. They tend to be very, very positive. Everything's fine, everything's wonderful. Um, you know, so to, to dig in and try to get those differences is also difficult from an educational point of view. If we wanna do something that's um, fairly in-depth and intellectual, you need to do that in urban areas. Um, but most of our audience, at least for the radio programming, is still in rural areas, so trying to get in for access of how you do that type of research um, is, is challenging. Um, so we've done work on our discussion programs, how they're perceived. We did something that was sort of tricky, but it turned out to be quite good. This issue of getting people to be critical, I did some work with lapsed listeners, so people who identified that they'd listened to Ozzy in the past, but they didn't anymore. Um, and so at that point, they at least had to tell us why they stopped listening. And that got us a little bit of that critical feedback of why did they turn to go to the BBC more? Um, or why had they, why had they stopped? Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough spot. I mean, it's definitely easier in other places. I always feel that there's a lot that we need to take into account in terms of the recruitment and what is it that we want to get and how complicated are we making it. You know, it's not, it's not a spot where we can usually uh, just say, please watch this program, you know, three times and come in and talk about it. That's not, that's not quite going to happen. And I know some of the stuff we did with D3 in Afghanistan, you know, we did do some sort of home exercises, but you really needed the field coordinator to be calling, or even better, going over to the house every day to make sure that it had really happened. Um, you know, and we're used to these panels being much more self-administrated, but they'd really need to add this in-depth interview component every day after the show to be you know, very clear that they listened to it and that it had happened and let's talk about it. Um, and then the whole thing, do we want people to write out a questionnaire? Well, we've been talking about the literacy rates. Uh, there's a lot that, that goes into it. Okay, let's give one uh, final round of applause to our presenters this morning. Just a reminder, um, the March event, um, March 19th, here in the Great Hall, focused on Iraq. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning. We're adjourned. <laughs>